go ahead and oh perfect we are recording and we're gonna turn on this thing and that thing guys it's been so long so long so long my voice just cracked it's like i'm going through puberty for the third time oh how has everybody been and like if you can't tell this baby face that's a joke i've i've always had a baby face never getting rid of it oh one day i'll grow up one day i can get full facial hair one thing all right anyway we're gonna do first of all Happy Thursday. It has been forever. I think we met last Thursday. I don't know. It's been that long that I honestly don't remember, but I hope everyone has been just excellent and staying out of the snow cone of Missouri right now. Stay inside, drink soup, drink coffee, whatever you need to do. Don't go out there. It is not fun, especially on 6440. It is a skating rink. Like, oh my gosh. All right. Uh, what am I doing right now? I'm getting this thing up there. Hopefully not a lot of you had to travel for work. I know some people do. It's always not fun. It's not even the snow that's dangerous. It's honestly, and fun fact, not trying to dive into this, biggest mind blower that I've had in a, like a long time is that Missouri is one of the few states, if not the only, that does not require uh, student driving. I or driver's ed, excuse me. I had no idea that was a big thing everywhere else, like Illinois and all over the like entire United States. I had no idea that Missouri's like one of the rare ones that does not require it. I'm like, well, that explains, that explains my terrible driving. That yeah. shows. <laughs> right? Oh, I'm not here to judge anybody else's driving. Honestly, I'm the one you should fear on the roads, but it's all good. All right. As you can tell, Kyle had coffee and some sleep. Thankful for that. Everybody ready to get fabulous tonight? I'm going to get you fab. Totes fab. All right. As always, if you have any questions, throw them in that lecture questions channel. We're going to go ahead and get on started here. As always, we're going to start with announcements. I think I, I feel like I'm missing something here. So if I'm missing something, let me know. I can do turn that off but i think that's about it okay anyway announcements as you all probably know today assignment number three is due today's the due date for that it is not a drop assignment so don't worry about that too much but if you don't have it done make sure that you are working on it make sure in any of your spare time you're focusing on that assignment number three that is a heavy hitter as you probably already know testing is no joke so with that, make sure that you're reaching out to your colleagues, your TA, scheduling time with me, whatever it takes to get over those knowledge gaps, answer those questions that you have to get assignment number three finished. Moving on, we have no studio review tonight. I'm no, I'm sorry, even longer without a just a sit down fireside chat with yours truly to go through that studio. Um, next week, though, they're coming back uh, stronger than ever. So yeah, no studio review tonight. Take that extra time to go through the studio with your partner. It's a partner lab. You'll find out that when you get in there, but really do get into the crux of it, get into the meat of it, mainly because Git is not going anywhere. And this is a great lecture, or excuse me, a great studio to get into that. All right. And then finally, one thing I forgot to put this because I got sidetracked before uh, lecture. Um, after tonight, you will have all the pieces required to complete assignment number four. So if assignment number three is behind you, start putting assignment number four ahead of you. Go ahead and at least read it, see what you need to do. It is a lot more fun than assignment three, I pinky promise. So do go ahead and try to check out assignment number four. Over this weekend, whatever you wanna do. All right, that's all I have for assignments. Any questions, comments, concerns? Wave backs because you missed me, anything like that. All right. Nothing at all. All right. Then let's get started with some fun stuff. All right. For this one, we are getting into Get and CSS. With this, we are going to be needing a few things. So if you want to follow along this lecture, I would love it to have some friends on this journey when we are learning this new material. So go ahead and feel free to fire up those terminals, those Git bashes that you have on your machine. We will be using them today, Bo Show. And then also feel free to open up Visual Studio Code. We will also be needing that today. Give you a quick moment. And let's get started with some questions. What is the tool that we use to save and share our code on our computer? What is it? Come on, hasn't been that long. It. 
Very good. Get and it's also one of our topics for tonight too. So yes, absolutely. G I T. Get it is. Continuing on. What is the command we use to make a copy of someone else's code onto our machine? Who remembers this one? Clone. Very good. Dang it. You guys said it too quick with sipping coffee. Absolutely right. Clone is the way to go. So today we're going to actually be starting a lecture using this clone. To run the clone command in your CLI with a git bash or the terminal, depending on what you're using, you always start with git. Just tell your CLI, I want to use git. And then what do you want to do? What do you want Git to do? I want it to clone. And then the next thing we need to provide it is this thing called a repo link. A repo link. This is where we actually need to tell our Git a little bit more extra about what we want to truly clone. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So we see git clone and that repo link right there. We need to talk about what is a repo link. We kind of talked about it last lecture, but again, it's been days since we talked last. So let's kind of refresh our memories. Repos or repo links about where code truly lives is a thing called GitHub out there in the cloud. You might've heard that buzzword, the cloud. It really is a place somewhere usually in like Ohio or like, I don't know, wherever there's cheap real estate, that's typically where they put the cloud, oh, okay, it's out there somewhere else. So GitHub is where our code lives remotely, remotely, hence making GitHub where our remote repositories live, remote repositories live. Our code is up there in the cloud somewhere. So right now we're gonna go find that code so we can start cloning the stuff onto our machine. Wrong swipe, there we go. So what we wanna do, and we'll get to this in a little bit tonight, I'm gonna go over here to github.com and feel free to go to this link. I'm gonna go ahead and share this right now. I'm gonna go back to actual code. Sorry about that, I was on a different page, double checking something. There we go, this is actually the repo. I'm gonna go ahead and post this right now into the lecture questions channel. Excuse me. That is the repository, the remote repository I'm currently looking at. It is my own, it is on my own repository. Feel free to go through the other codes, a lot of launch code stuff on there, maybe some small embarrassing little projects when I was little, but this is my repository. So what I wanna do is actually grab that link for the remote repository. In order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and click code. And then right here, my HTTPS, I'm going to copy this link. This is the link again to my remote repository, the thing we want to clone from. For you, you are more than welcome right now because I'm allowing it to clone this repository directly onto your machine. The caveat to that is, is that you are going to take my copy. So if I edit my copy, your copy will become out of sync. Basically, we are now teammates if you copy this directly. That's fine, I'd love to be your teammate, but a lot of people like to edit their own repository at their own speed. If that is the case, you wanna make a copy to your own remote repository. To make a copy of this repository onto your own remote repository, we do a thing called fork. Forking, is this button up here in the top right. If you click fork, GitHub will copy this repository into your own remote repository account with GitHub. We're not gonna do that because we're already in mine. So I'm gonna copy this link directly. So remember, fork it. If you don't wanna be my teammate, I completely understand. Not gonna hold it against you. Let's go and hop over to, not here, and I don't know why you're doing that today. So what I'm gonna do now is open up a nice fresh terminal. You can also open up Git Bash. I'm just gonna be using terminal today. Second there, clear that, perfect. So we come down here and I see that I am in my home directory. If I wanna change directory, what command do I run? If I wanna to go to a different directory. CD, CD, right? Very good, CD. Today I'm gonna to be going into my desktop Oh, sorry. Actually, first, I want to see the list of things I can go into. See the list of things I can go into. For Max, you do LS. For Kyle, has no idea what's going on there. Uh, what's now? Well, yeah, there we go. Go home, Mac, uh, like MacBook. Sorry, my back MacBook was uh, 
a little drunk there. Thought it was not a command. There you go, CD. Let me go into my home directory. Sorry about that. There we go. So I'm going to go CD. I'm going to go clear this out. It was just taken from a previous session there. So I'm going to LS. I'm going to CD into desktop. Also, a small thing, if you have to type out a long name and you've already typed out most of it, if you press the tab key, it will typically autofill for you. That's why desktop was so fast there. So I'm going to go into desktop. Now I'm going to LS. I'm going to go into LC for launch code. Type clear so we remove all that. LS, and now I see in here. LC is the area that I want to contain my LC projects, launch code projects. So when I find my major file or folder that I want to contain all my projects in, this is where I clone from. Do not make a separate folder automatically, or sorry, do not make a separate folder for your project. GitHub will do that for you. And we'll see that right now. Like I said, I want to do git clone, and then I'm going to paste in that link that I copied before. I'll make this a little bit bigger here. There we go. So once I type in that, I press enter, and it's gonna clone it onto my machine. I see that it unpacks a bunch of stuff, and there we go. If I type in ls again, I see that lecture 14 my zoo is now inside my machine. So awesome. What just happened was, is that we were on GitHub. Like we said, we wanted to bring it on, on to our machine. On our machine, we're running Git, not GitHub. You are running Git. GitHub is the hub or the cloud where everything is actually stored at. In Git, we have our local repository. What I just did is I sent up that clone command to the GitHub. And what it did was it reciprocated by sending me back the copy of the repo. So I now have a copy of that code on my local repository, on my local machine. That right there is how we just had communication with GitHub versus our Git, our local machine. Awesome. Any questions on that? Anything at all? Yeah, I am just a little bit curious. While we're pulling information from, um, you know, uh, different like um, GitHub accounts and then putting them into our terminal, what do we have to do to like make sure that we're safeguarded? What do you mean by safeguarded? Um, is there any kind of additional kind of threat since we're working directly in terminal with like pulling like links like that and working on them in our There's terminal? Always so you're downloading something onto your computer. So there's always a basic threat there is that are you downloading a virus? So you should always be making sure that where you are pulling from, you know that source. Hopefully, I'm not going to be giving you a virus. Pinky promise. Again, I'm not going to be giving you a virus. So you can well, trust you, my yeah. sources. But other sources out there, other open source projects, yes, there is always a risk there. However, GitHub usually does some scans itself to make sure that no malware is going into it or things like that. But you are still working on the internet. You are still downloading things. There's always a risk, but the risk is very minimal. So okay. make sure you're just okay. trusting the sources that you're bringing onto your machine always, no matter if it's a repository through Git or really just a program out there. Okay. Yeah, usually from Git also, you'll see, let me find it, not right here because this is a very small repository, but you'll see how popular the project actually is. You'll see like how many downloads it gets a week or something like that. If it's a pretty high number, it's usually a pretty good project. If it's low numbers, either the code's bad or they just don't have anything good in there. So that's another way to kind of tell. But usually with GitHub, you're okay. pretty much safe. Great question. Any other questions out there? All right, let's keep going then. So we brought our repository on to our machine. Fantastic. Let's go actually explore this thing, what we brought on here. Visual Studio Code here. My computer has been slow as molasses today, so give it a second. I don't know if it's just cold or something. There we go. Um, what do I want to put you? I want to put you right there. All right. Awesome. So we are in here. We are in. For some reason, start things. It doesn't exist anymore. Oh, let me go and actually open it. That's what I'm doing. I'm in one thing. I'm going to open now. Once I'm in. Visual Studio Code, I need to press open so I can actually open up that project that I just cloned onto my machine. I'm going to go to Kyle Wagner, go to desktop, go to LC, go to single click on my Lecture 14 My Zoo folder, and then press open. 
Remember, we need to open folders, not individual files in Visual Studio Code. Remember that. It is how we get a lot of problems. Open up folders, not files. We open up our project folder and inside of it, we see that we have two fun little files, the readme.md, which again is kind of just an instruction booklet for, um, for GitHub. And then we have our start.html. This one is all for you. This is our HTML file for today. So let's get started by making some HTML. Bring it on back, folks. Tell me out. We already have our doc type HTML. That always goes at the top of our pages here, but which tag do we use to start creating a website? Let's start making things. HTML. HTML. Doc, Good, doc HTML. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. After HTML, so HTML is what creates that page. What are the only two tags, only two tags that go between the HTML tag? Head and the body, I think. Very good. You have a head and you have a body. Those are the only two things that go into what is a page. So head and a body. Very good. I'm going to put body down here for just a second. There we go. Perfect. Inside of the head, give me one extra tag that we know that goes into the head. Titan. 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 The title is one of them. Awesome. And this one we're going to say my starting page. All right. And then this one's all fun to you all. Give me just one of your favorite tags that goes into the body tag. Anybody got a good one? H1, headline. There we go, H1. Let's go and do it, H1. H1 stands for header one. It is there to basically make your text smaller or larger. So H1 is the largest our headers can get, and it goes down to H6. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and save this, and we are going to see it in action. Let's go back over to our LC. So if you're going to run your website, go into your project, and then you're going to usually double click on your start.html. Sometimes that will open up some weird things. If you need to, just go, you can always right click and say open with, but this one will open up Safari, yay Safari, and it will show us our website here. Could you say that one more time because I was just finishing up the title, we have to go where after we save it? So we go back to our project folder, like we see here, I'm in lecture 14-my-zoo, and I double clicked on start.html. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. All right. So there we go, we have created our website. It has only been a few minutes, and we have already created a website. Look at us go. If only the 2000s could see us now. What? Any questions out there that I can answer? Let me get my Slack back up here so I'm not missing anything. So, Seema, you might be getting, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say that my hide didn't pop up and so I was hoping that you might be able to show your code again. Let me go grab that code real quick. Seema, to your question real quick, um, if you're, if, and to anybody out there, if you are on a Mac and you're getting permission issues uh, while cloning the link, um, ask your TA tonight. You might have some issues with just how GitHub has done its security in the past uh, few months. They kind of changed something, some things up. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you continue to have issues, feel free to reach out to me. I know a few other students in the past and also in this class are getting that issue. Um, to Sydney, can't you also right click and run the page while it's still in VS? Technically, yeah, you could. Yeah, if you wanted to right click here and I think, yeah, it's like, uh, I don't exactly know. I've seen some students do it. I, I just go directly. Yeah, we can say open with or something like that. Yeah, it, it all depends. If you want to do it through uh, Visual Studio Code, go for it. Absolutely. All right. Any so other questions? I, uh, is yeah, this Hannah. the way you run the oh. code? So technically it's running it. Yeah, what we did is we opened it up and in the browser, and the browser will run your code, aka make the HTML visual, visual to you as the person. So in a sense, this is kind of running the code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, unlike JavaScript, JavaScript has a start and end to their application. HTML is more like building a house. You told it how to build the house, and the house will stay there as long as the browser is open. So think of JavaScript as a honey badger, it'll just run across the street, it's done. HTML is there to stay. You constructed something, and now it will stay visual as long as the browser session is open. So yeah, in a sense, it is technically running the code. Great question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, what's going on? Please explain me how to uh, copy the code to the computer again. 
so go ahead and so it's with git clone feel free mm -hmm. to look up git clone uh, but I can't do it again because I've already cloned just the computer, but get clone and then the repository link. If you need to, of course, it's always being recorded and you can go back through it. But yeah, get clone in that repository link through GitHub that I posted in the lecture questions channel. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, what's up, Matthew? Oh, yeah. You said that the only way to get it so our directories won't be synced is if we forked it. What does I'm I'm confused on what that means if we still need to like update our own HTML to get that to appear on our side. So forking it means that once you fork something, my repository and your repository are two separate entities. So that means if you push, it's only gonna be pushed to your repository, not mine. Gotcha. If you don't fork, if you don't fork and you only clone, when you push, it'll be pushed to my repository. Okay, I got you. Yep, absolutely. Great question there. Yeah, forking basically what it exactly was as a deviates. Unfortunately, it has nothing to do with dining. I always thought that. No, forking just means it's going to be on two separate routes. So two separate entities. Uh, David, can you double click HTML file and then it will execute an external JS file? Uh, we haven't really talked about any of that, especially with the JavaScript inside of HTML. So maybe to your question, but I'd hold on to at least next lecture for that one. We'll dive into JS and HTML. All right, everyone, we're going to keep this, on going here. Let's this is forking look. also where you get the pull requests, right? Because you, you fork the code and make a change, and then you make a pull request to the original repository and ask if they'd like to pull the code from your fork into the For sure. original so what, branch. Yeah, no, no, I get, I get where you're coming from. And uh, no, so to your point, that is not forking. Forking is making two, like basically copy and pasting repositories. What you're referring to is the, the what is called, oh, excuse me, it's called branching. So that is the concept of branching, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But no, pull requests have, will have nothing really to do with, uh, with the forking. It'll have to do with the branching. All right. So let's go ahead and keep going. We're going to talk about a little bit more about HTML. I want to introduce you all to something a little bit more in HTML before we continue. As we already know, these elements or these tags here all hold their own weight of something. They all do something cool. Body creates what we see. H1 creates giant text. If that's not awesome, I don't know what is. Paragraphs create paragraphs of text, etc. But did you know that inside these tags, we can include even more stuff inside of them? That stuff being things called attributes. Attributes are general little tidbits of information you can include in your tags to give it more definition, if you will, more customization or custom, I don't know, those, whatever those words are. But attributes is what we're going to explore real quick. And two major attributes we're going to be exploring today is one called, first one is going to be called class. Class. So I'll show you how to exactly insert an attribute here. So we go into the tag here, H1, then I press space, and then I type in class, then equals, and then it automatically gives me these two quotes here. I'm gonna call it my class. Now, if you're asking yourself what a class is, it's basically a way to group tags together. What are maybe a bunch of different tags that are of the same variety? So basically, if I wanted to come down here, I said, um, for some reason, I have two headers or whatever like that. So I could say my header two. I could create a class that says maybe my headers. So basically, it's about grouping common tags together that all hold the, about the same purpose. The next one I want to do, the next attribute I want to cover real quick, is called ID. You all know what an ID is, but it's also a very powerful attribute. How we provide that is again, we say ID equals, and then we give it a unique identifier. Please always make sure that you keep your IDs unique in any sense, but including HTML. Will you get yelled at? No. Will you get in trouble down the road? Possibly by your own logical mistake. So do try to keep your IDs unique. So in this one, I'll call it header one. And down here, I just won't give it an ID because IDs are optional, just like classes. All attributes in just raw form of HTML are all optional. 
you do not need to provide these attributes if you don't want to. But class and ID are the very two very powerful attributes I want you all to be aware of as we move forward in our lecture today. So two more I really just want to just briefly touch on and we'll talk about them later are style. And then another one is on click. Now, we won't dive into either of these too much style a little bit on click and not at all today, but I wanted you to be aware these are what we call attributes. Style is how we make things have some style. We're talking we'll talk about styling here in just a moment, but on click is a thing called an event. That's all I'm going to say about it tonight. You do not need to remember that. We'll talk about it more next week. But I wanted to again introduce you to these attributes. I pinky promise they are very powerful tools and I want you all to be aware of them. As of right now, I'm going to go ahead and just take those two out. And class and ID are what we're actually going to be focusing on for right now. Awesome. All right. One more thing, what I want to do tonight, and then right click. I'm going to say new file. And I have written everyone something for tonight. Also, I think I'll grab that code just so we don't have to waste our time writing all of it. But of course, a zoo project needs a zoo. So I'm going to say new file here. And what I'm going to call this file, because it's going to be my homepage, is called index.html. You will see index.html very commonly in a website. Index.html means that it is its starting page. It is the home page for a website. Index means basically the head honcho page. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in there and save that and save that. Awesome. Let's go ahead and see index.html just real quick. What I'm going to do is come over here. Of course, we can go back in there and just click on index.html. What I'm going to do is come up here and I'm going to just backspace start and put in index. Press enter. And Safari, you will never win me over. Oh, dang it. See, this is why I don't like you, Safari. You're just weird. I shouldn't be judging. I shouldn't be judging browsers. I apologize. There we go. Look at our awesome zoo right now. Look at this lion. It's a giant picture of a lion. Who's a giant picture of a lion? Look at that little bear. He's catching a fish. Oh, look at that little trout, that poor trout. And then a giant tiger here. And I, I apologize, it's just a tiger butt, but I promise there is more to that tiger. There we go, there's that face. All right, so we got three pictures of a tiger. Um, <laughs> what was I trying to do today? Oh yeah, it was like lions, bears, and tigers. Oh my, yes. And you can tell Kyle has been fully caffeinated today. So yes, we have a web page written. Look at that, it's freaking awesome. So that is what we have right now. Let's go ahead and keep exploring. I just wanted to put in this code so we had something to work with as we move forward today with our CSS and stuff. Awesome. All right. Any questions that we have about any of this, don't read this code just yet. I pinky promise. Again, apparently that's the word of the day for me today. It will be out there for you all to see. We'll get out there in a moment. But any questions about any of the attribute stuff or so the HTML stuff that we covered before we move on? I had a quick question, Kyle. I was wondering if... I noticed that in your code, you, um, you, I'm wondering if spacing matters for, um, you know, like how in Replit, you know, you have a space before and after the equal sign, and I didn't see that there, and I'm just wondering, does that matter? <laughs> so, with the attributes that I showed, spacing does matter. You want to make sure that you give your attribute a space and then put in class, and then it does not matter. It can stay. I would say keep that contained. The equal sign and the the equal sign and the double quotes. You should all keep contained as one. But you should always definitely separate this because if you don't, HTML will think that you are trying to call it to the H3 class tag. So a space does matter there. So in some regards, it does matter. But when it comes to just those attributes, just make sure you keep them together, just so you know everything's contained. Does it kind of help out? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I got a quick question. On that second file that you named for index, um, how did you name that? Um, index or start? For the index. How did I name how it? Did or you, like, yeah, how did you go about naming it? Did you have to like save it first in order to name it? So what you do in Visual Studio Code is you can right click, 
this is what I did, press new file. And then a new file will pop up and I say my file. And I usually want to create a, sorry, my computer's being absolutely slow today. Oh my gosh, buddy, come on. There we go, myfile.html. Oh my gosh, it just doesn't want to do work today. There we go. There we go, HTML. So what I did is I typed in myfile.html, in that case, index.html. I pressed enter and it creates that new file for you. Okay, awesome. Cool, and then if Visual Studio Code ever wants to catch up, we can keep on moving on, there we go. All right, well, I'm cleaning this up. Any final questions before we keep on going? How about image source here? Image source will always be HTTPS link? Nope, it can also be different things inside of your project as well. We won't go too much in the image tag right now, but if you want to look it up, image, the source SRC um, can be something in your local machine as well. This is just an online picture that I found, so I pasted it in there really quick. Okay, then in that case, image source is equal to, we'll have to provide the complete path, like, uh, Say that, say that again. Look, if the image is in my local uh, drive, local hard disk, then how do I uh, specify the image source path here? So go ahead and look that one up. But what you have to do is take the entire path of where the image is. So if you're in a Windows machine, it'll be C drive, and then yeah. exactly where the image is located, and you paste that in there. But it looks like okay. TA Sean, thank you for that. He posted information about the image uh, source tag. So click on that, but it will give you more examples. But to hopefully help out a little bit, if you're on a Windows machine, C drive, and then where the full path okay. to where that image is. Um, if you're on a Windows drive, you're going to do the tilde, and then of course everything else. So okay, thank you. Absolutely. Also, uh, in one of our exercises, um, they pointed out that we could uh, upload our image to Dropbox and then paste the URL. Yep. Absolutely. Source is exactly where the image is located, whether it be on your local machine or on the web. You've got to paste that exact path where it's going to be. Awesome, awesome. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and bring it back here. So we just finished up a bunch of HTML stuff. We added some files. So we added a bunch of files to our repository, our local repository. What command should we run now? Forget, hint. Are we ready to commit it? Like get we are ready to start in the process of it, of committing and pushing our stuff, but what? We could do status. Uh, status see. will show us exactly Need the changes add. that we made. What was it? Need add. Get add. Very good. Get add. Add is the next thing. Add or get add is what we use to add the files that we've created to our next commit or to the status of our Git repository, our local repository. Finally. In this case, the book, give me, give me one second. And then after this, get add. So what you can do here is that typically, the, I believe the book said a dot. The dot is what, it, someone asked me specifics about what the dot was pertaining to. Um, I kind of got it there, kind of didn't, so I want to make sure I go into it. But this is basically the path that you want to add your files from. So this will add anything in that root directory, that dot, basically your base directory. I usually run the dash, at, uh, dash A to add everything in the project. That's just my habit, but feel free to use that dot right now too, if you would like to. If it doesn't work, feel free, yeah, feel free to do the dash A. So yeah, git add dash A, there's that giant lion. Let's go back over here and do that. So what we're gonna do, so we're gonna CD into our project folder, which is lecture 14. If you're already in your project folder, you don't need to get into it. Now let's see, well it said git status, let's just see that. Looks like we modified a start.html, which is true. And we added this index.html. Both are in green, or sorry, both are in red. We need at least the added file in green. So what I'm going to write is git add with that period there, and then run that git status again. Look at that. Now we actually added all those changes. <laughs> now it's time to actually save them to our local repository. So that being said, what command do we run next to do that? Commit. Git commit. Git commit. We want to commit. Very good. Git commit. What comes after git commit? Dash M. Dash M. And the comment. Good. Dash M. Where dash M stands for message. And we need to provide that message there. So we did stuff. 
let's go ahead and do that. So git commit dash m we did stuff. Oh, actually, sorry. I usually leave um, like exclamation points, periods and stuff out of my commits just because of horrible past experiences. So we did stuff. There we go. Awesome. And then we committed this thing. So we say get status here. And now we see that there's nothing to commit. Our working area is clean. Fantastic. So we have a commit. We have committed this to our local repository that changes there. But that does not reflect to the other repository out there. So my question is, what do we do to share our changes to a remote repository out in GitHub? Git push. Git push. push. Good. We push yeah. those changes out. Very good, everyone. So yeah, git push is what we run next. So let's go ahead and do that. Git push. Awesome. Once git push is done, we come over to our GitHub. Oh my gosh, I have so many tabs here. I'm going to go ahead and refresh this on our remote repository here. And now we see that index.html and start.html are here. If I click on index.html, look at that. It's all of the stuff we just saw. If we go over to the other one, if it lets me. No, we don't want to. There we go. Start.html, it's also the stuff. So we committed all of our changes and pushed them here. So now our remote repository can see them. Awesome. So what happened was, is that we had GitHub on our code and our Git. What we did is that we changed the code locally on our Git down here, our local repository, and then we pushed the changes up. Once we push those changes up, again, we see that change reflected in our remote repository. That's how we are working with GitHub with our local repositories on Git and that's CLI. Um, Alina, so should the message that goes with the Git commit be descriptive of what changes were made? Yes, typically you definitely wanna do that. If you, especially if you're in a working environment with a team or even out there on your own projects, yes, put like what you did. So in that message, it should have been more like, add it index.html with a bunch of zoo animals or something along those lines. Something really of description, what you did. Also, feel free to commit as much as you want. You can do a lot of commits. So if you do a task, commit. If you do another task, commit again. You can have eight commits and push them all at once. So commits are just like pressing the save button on a Word document. Save it as much as you want. Just have some kind of description about what you did. But when you do commit, make sure that it's at least stable-ish code or code that you trust. You don't want to be committing errors. All right, so cool. My, just one question. Yeah. So when we are working on a local repo, uh, so does it save a copy of our work other than the current folder where we are working? Because what nope, I did is I did a commit, then I deleted my main file um, where I was working. Then... Under git status, it was showing there is one file which is already deleted. Do you want to restore it? I said restore and then it restored that file. But I just wanted to make sure where exactly it so saves our uh, repo on locally. So, so in, in a sense, yes, it does hold a copy or your history of what you have done in, in, a, in a sense. So yes, it does do that. So if you do have, if you do want to revert some of your old files, you are able to do that. Get what Git will do is hold a, oh my gosh, I'm drawing the blank on the word, but basically yeah, it'll hold your Git history of all the changes that you made. So you can undo back to a previous point. If you're on a computer and like your computer goes bad, gets a virus, remember you have like restore points where you can go back and restore your computer from, it's kind of like that. So yes, in a, in a sense, you know, yes, they do have a copy of what you have done and you can revert back to that if need be does that kind of help okay, out okay so it is pro okay it is project wise maybe if i'm working on one project it will keep a copy somewhere in that project itself so. it will keep a copy of the changes that you made yes oh. Uh, okay, so how do we get the repo link of others? Do they have to share it with us? You can, they can either have to share it with you or you have to know what GitHub they're in. So you can go to other people's GitHub and explore their projects. And if it's a public project, you can clone it. 
kind of like what we saw if you go to my repo because i shared that link you can go and see my other repositories and clone which one you feel like can you go back to the terminal please i can real quick there you go if there if we were to get the code error fatal not a get repository we tried to clone what is the use of this i would say double check that link make sure that you are copying the entire link the ending should have a dot get that is an actual repo link. If it continues to uh, be an issue, feel free to hang on to the very end of class and take a quick look at it or ask your TA. Awesome, awesome. Any other questions? I, I was able to clone this repo, the zoo repo, but then okay. it didn't reflect all the changes. So now should I pull or? If you're talking about the changes that we just pushed up, yes, you're allowed to do a git pull to get them onto your machine. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. If those images were local to your PC, would it get uploaded as well with a push? Or would those picture links be broken? Technically, those picture links would be broken if you go to the C drive or something like that, because when you are up in space or up in the cloud, it doesn't know what your C drive is. So yeah, those images would actually have to be inside your project and pushed up with it in order for those links not to be broken. Otherwise, they have to be on the web. It's got a little bit more fun and a little bit tricky, but yes, um, to answer your question, they would be broken. All right, we're gonna have to keep on going here. All right, everyone. So one thing I want to talk to you all about today is that we just learned how to push, pull, commit, add all that fun stuff on Git. Awesome. But as we know, GitHub is for collaboration among teams. So you are typically not the only one on a repository. Of course, in LC, as we're learning, yes, you will be the only one, that's fine. But as you get in the liftoff and into the corporate environment or just into a tech job in general, you're gonna start working with teammates. So in this case, we have a teammate one and a teammate two. As we're pushing up into this GitHub, that's awesome, but there are also other teammates pushing and pulling as well. There are usually a lot of changes going on in the repository, especially for a big project. And my team personally, I'm, where I work, I have two other team members, so it's about three, but it can get up to, up to eight members. And that's people working on just one application, pushing and pull constantly all day, because people want to get their work all done. So with this, at least from my perspective, I would see that this is a big problem. That big problem being that there it could be a lot of back and forth or basically a lot of collisions going on. Essentially, we are having a lot of mayhem in our code base. People are trying to work on it and stepping on each other's toes. When we step on each other's toes in coding, we call these things merge conflicts. When we are trying to push up code, but someone's already edited that code and we're trying to like just mess with somebody else's stuff and we're not up to date, blah, blah, blah we're causing a lot of havoc. We're causing those merge conflicts. We won't go too much into what a merge conflict truly is, but essentially that is a bad day. A lot of people don't like to see that. So our question today is, how do we keep all that pushing and pulling straight? How do we keep those collisions to a minimum? And that's what we kind of want to explore today. So in order to do that, we're going to bring in that code that we've been working on. Say we're all on a team here. In this case, we're gonna have two members just to keep it simple for us right now. And these two team members are both on GitHub. We're both pulling from the same repository. Say myself and you are working on that one repository we've been working with all class. That's cool. Each of us wanna do something special with this code. I wanna edit the header and maybe you want to edit whatever, the images or something like that, whatever you wanna do. So with this analogy or with this story, let's go ahead and see what we have to do. The code right now that we see out there is basically our main code. It's the original stuff out there. That's completely fine. But again, if we start to work on that main code, we're going to have a problem. We're gonna eventually step on each other's toes. It's like dancing in like a little one foot by one foot square with each other. If we're both just in that main code, it's such a small code base. So wouldn't it be easier to dance if we both have our separate locations? Wouldn't it be easier to code if we have our own separate locations or areas to work in? Hence why we create our own areas to work in. What I would do if I was blue here, teammate one, 
I would create a copy of that code base that I can work in all by myself. That no matter what you do, push and pull, my code is not affected. When I say copying this code into my own little workspace, what this is called is that I'm branching off that main code. I'm creating a branch off my code so that when I'm working on it, only my issues or my things that I type in will affect my branch. It's my own private little bubble to work in that you can't come in and step on my toes unless you really wanted to, but please don't. So with these branches, we typically give them a name as well. Like I said, I want to work on the header. So I say add header branch. Now that's awesome. I have my own workspace, but what about you? You're important too. You want to work on that image. So what you do is that you take that main code and you make a copy also. We'll call it that place, uh, place the image branch because you want to create a new image. Awesome. You have your own code, code bases as well. So cool. Now I'm trying to add my header. We are both working at different paces. That's fine. We're human. We all work at different paces. We can't just be on everyone else's schedule. So myself, my header job was a little bit easier. So I got my code written. Cool. Once my code has been written, I'm all done. It's all tested. My header looks amazing. I want to make sure that our main code down in our main branch, our stuff that we actually show to users, is, has this beautiful header I just created. So what I want to do is take my change and put it back into the main code. I want to put it back into this main code. What I just did was I just merged my branch back into the main code, into main. What I did it was just merged it back in there. So now when I merge my code, the main code is updated with my change there. That's awesome. Now my header is on this main website. I'm famous. That's great. So as we continue on, the issue is, is that you're still working on your image because you have a big task at hand. You got to put an image out there. So you're going to continue to work. But the problem comes in is that you are out of sync with the main code now. This main code has my change and has that beautiful header, but you don't have it. This is an issue. Because right now you're coding out as something that's very old, it's outdated. Maybe a bug is still in there that I fixed instead. You don't want that. So what you do, because you're a smart developer, is that you take whatever's in that main code, all those changes, and you merge it into your code base. You're still working, but you're going to merge my change into your branch. You're going to merge my change into your branch. So now my change is in your code. That's great. You want that header. You want that bug fix. And as you continue to work, that's awesome. You're going to add your own line of code there to your own branch. Because again, this is your own private bubble. And once you're done adding that image in there, you want the world to see your work as well. So what do you do? You merge your code back into the main branch so somebody can see it. And this right here is the concept of merging and branching inside of Git. Another term you might hear is a Git workflow. This right here is how developers will work out in the wild with Git. And it's also how we protect ourselves from people introducing bad code. So to answer your question, Raiden, before, where do these pull requests come from? It's whenever you're trying to merge back into this main branch, a pull request would occur. A pull request is basically a way to police somebody from merging just any bad code into the main branch, kind of what we just saw there. A pull request makes somebody actually go review that code and be like, okay, it looks good. Check mark. Feel free to merge back into this main branch and all the changes are there. Zero to do you get notified when somebody merges their branch with the main branch? Not all the time, not by default. There are settings you can do, and some work to, or some teams actually do that, but not all the time. So if it is set up, you do, but not by default, if that makes sense. Git has a lot of uh, a lot of settings in there that you can do that to make sure that you're not caught off guard. But in essence, it can be done, but it's just not there again by default. All right, real quick. 
I'm going to go ahead and unmute you guys. Sorry about that. Um, feel free to also yell out your question at me. I know this is a very fun, tricky little thing. I just want to go, I have, can you explain that merging to branch again? So merging means that you are kind of like what we see here is that we're taking whatever code I was just working on and bringing it or putting it into our main branch. Mikhail, I have a question. Yeah, Jody, what's up? If, so you just said that uh basically a pull request tells somebody hey somebody's merged this code in go take a look at this code before it's accepted that way somebody doesn't push in bad code but then you said you that people aren't notified of the merging but they would have to be if they have to approve the merged code in other words if 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 before something can be merged it has to be manually approved then by definition they'd have to get notified that something needed to be manually approved Right, right, exactly. I also said that all these settings are in there and you can customize GitHub to however you want to act. Pull requests so if you are not didn't, necessary. Oh, give me so one second. If you, pull requests are not necessary to everybody out there, by the way. Pull requests are not necessary. So yes, your hour act completely accurate to where if you did do pull requests, you would be notified, but it is not, um, yeah, it's not required in oh, default setup of GitHub. So then you wouldn't even have a pull request, at which point it would just automatically merge the code. By default, that is how GitHub is set up. Pull requests are there if your team wants to utilize them, but they are not required. And I assume you could set it up that if you are the master coder of a project, your stuff doesn't get pull requested, but your subordinates would or your teammates would if they're not the like owner of the project? Technically, you could technically maybe do that. Um, I, I would that'd be very, very a, a niche setting, but it's possibly there. Um, our, our teams in environments that I've worked in, we've never do, done that, but the possibility is there. GitHub is very customizable to each team's needs. Interesting. Cool. Any other questions? Kyle? Kyle. No. <laughs> yes. The do you want me to go ahead or do you want me go ahead, to Hannah. yep yep go okay. ahead so if i um, create a branch and then if i um do some changes only i can merge the changes right like somebody working on some other branch cannot merge my changes technically if you keep that branch locally so branches exist on your local repository and if you push your branches is now on the remote repository. Once they're on the remote uh, remote repository, anyone can check them out. So to answer your question, it is possible. I don't want to confuse you anymore, but it is possible that someone can go check out your branch and merge it into develop if they truly or into main if they truly wanted to. But it is common practice that one person to one branch. Okay. So so normally or ideally yes to answer your question yes you are the only person that should be working on that branch and merging it into main when it's ready because we had a question on the check your understanding that's why i asked thank you yeah absolutely and i heard I, one more question too yeah what's up yeah. um how do we ensure that we are always merging the latest code we always want to make sure that we are pulling before we uh, before we merge. So we always are trying to pull from main. The one branch that everyone's working on, we are always trying to pull. So making sure we're, are we update our uh, our branch to whatever main has in it before we try to merge. So to answer your question, we should very much be pulling often from the main branch if we have a lot of people working on that branch. So why we pull the code? So our changes will be lost, isn't it? So we were working on a code for a long time. And if you're pulling a, uh, the latest code from there, so the changes that we made, will it be lost? Nope, oh. they will be merged together. Hence the word merge. Oh, okay. Yep, so everything will merge together. Hence, if you were working on the same line someone else was, and you both have different answers, say you write A on your file and B on your, their file on the same line, and you try to merge, that is called a merge conflict. Merge conflict is where two people were trying to work on the same line of code at the same time, and that causes bad Mondays. So always make sure you are in communication with your team when you are merging. 
does the branch, uh, especially main in this case, does does it keep, um, shall we say, so let's say, I don't know, somebody merges some code to main, somebody else merges their code, they, they think it's all pleasing, turns out there's a big bug. Does it keep some sort of way you could roll back to a previous period so that the bug is then gone so that then you can try again? Like, yep, absolutely. You can roll back to other, uh, other merges or other commits. Yep. That's cool. You can also whole idea do, of GitHub is rolling back. Well, yeah, it's one, it's definitely one perk for sure. Get history is not commonly used. You, you typically don't want to do that, but yeah, th that, that practice is there and yeah. I'm not going to say the other thing I was going to say. Well, no, I will. If you really want to know who introduced the bug to, it's called Git Blame, where you can find actually what author of the code for that line. It's always a fun thing during team meetings when we have to do that. I All saw right. the tab beside the. I saw the tab beside the um, branch, and I wondered what the blame was. Like beside raw, it was the blame button. Git blame, yes, absolutely. Git blamed is used by other developers on their team to produce constructive criticism for other developers on the team that introduce bad code into their code base. Okay. Is the most politically correct way I can phrase that. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. So how do you differentiate between merging to and merging from the main branch to make sure you don't get the two confused? So you have to be in a, we're actually, you know what? That's a great segue. We're gonna go ahead and we are, what I need to do for the next portion right here, we are going to go ahead and actually create a branch real quick. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Right now to check out what, or to see what kind of branch I'm in, you need to type in get branch. So as of right now, the branch I'm in, cause I know this font is small, it says main in green. It says main in green. So that means I'm in the main branch. For this one, I, the developer, want to add maybe something to my HTML. So I'm going to say get branch, and then the name of the branch, add header branch. Once I do that, I type in get branch again to see the list of branches, and I see that main is still green because it's still my selected branch, but I've just created one called add branch header. Mm, excuse me, add header branch. In order to switch over to that branch, I type in get checkout, get checkout, and then the name of the branch, add header branch. There we go. And now it says switch over to branch, add header branch. Now, if I go into my code, I just love how we keep seeing that line every time I swipe. Welcome to my zoo. What I can do now is edit this as much as I possibly want, and it's all in my workspace. So I put a couple exclamation points there, whatever. Um, Maybe I want to make this an H3 instead or H2, I guess, because that's the whole finger. I think I just want to press that one. There we go. And I save that. So I come over here. And what I want to do is I say get status. And it says I modified index.html. That's awesome. I'm going to say get add. And then period. Get status again. And it should be in green. There we go. And then we say get commit dash message updated HTML. Of course, you want to be a little bit more descriptive, but we're just doing this quick for an example. So take a very close look. We're about to do a magic trick. Welcome to my zoo has three exclamation points. Down here has H2. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say git check out, and I'm going to check back out main. Remember, we have two branches, add header and main. I'm going to check out our main again. Everybody ready for that magic trick? <laughs> take a look at our header now. What happened? It's gone. Uh, it's gone. Uh, yeah. Just like that. What just happened is that we switched back over to our main branch where those exclamation points never existed. It's a completely other workspace. Look down here. Our H5 is right back. We switched back to our original code. Those changes are now gone because they are in the add header branch, a completely separated area. Hence the separation between our main branch or any other branch and the one we're working with. If we go back and check out, get check out, add header branch, 
We do that, we switch over to the branch and voila, our exclamation points are back. It's all about the branch that you're on. That's where your changes are truly stashed. So remember that. Now to answer your question, let's go ahead and make sure in here, get status. We have nothing there, we have our commits. We're gonna go ahead and get push. We're gonna push our changes up there. There we go, we push our changes up there. And now what I wanna show you real quick is that we just pushed all of our branches up here into our GitHub. So what does that mean exactly? Our branches are also accessible. If we come over here to main, we click on main, which again is that branch, but we also see add header branches here too. We can go down to this branch and check out things that we've done. We didn't do anything on start HTML, so we're not gonna see anything different. But if we go over to here to index.html, guess what? Our exclamation points are back. Again, this is branching. It's the same code, different workspaces, but the edits that you do on those workspaces stay in those workspaces until you merge. So let's go and check that out. I now want my main to have those three exclamation points. So what I do is I say, after I've pushed, I have to make sure those commits and pushes are out there. I say, get checkout to the branch I want to pull in those new changes which is going to be main. So I check out main. Again, real quick, we're gonna come over here, no exclamation points. Now what I do is I say get merge, and then the name of the branch I wanna merge into my main. So I say get merge, add, oh my gosh, add header branch. Press enter. And now I see things have now edited, or excuse me, have pulled in those changes. I say get branch one more time. I see that main is still selected. Again, nothing up my sleeves. Main is still selected here. We come over here and now the exclamation points are back. Right, should I go to Las Vegas or not? I feel like I should definitely be in a magic act. But that right there is how we do the get merge. So to answer your question, what we wanna do to make sure we are in the right areas, make sure you are in the branch that you wanna update. So when you merge, changes you merge into the branch that you were have checked out that you have checked out so any questions on what we just saw there i should have told you all the quick pop well, let's say you're in the let's say you're in your own personal branch and i don't know uh you've done a bunch of edits to code uh but somebody overnight edited the main code like they pushed like a feature release or bug fix to the main code mm -hmm. yep. and you want to add that to your code if you merge main into your workspace aren't all the edits that you just completed going to be like ghosted like they're going to disappear nope. right because so that's the keyword that's the keyword merge we're going to merge both sides together so if you they edited code in one area and you edit code in another area a merge brings both areas into the same place. We merge all code changes together. And there's no conflict, right, as long as you are not working on the same code as someone else. So you just need to know. Exactly. Your exactly right. You need to know your code and where your, where your teammates are working. If you both are working on line 110 in file whatever, and you try to merge together, that's when you get a merge conflict and people get angry. So there's still always potential for a merge conflict, but it's all about that communication with the collaboration in Git that keeps you from doing that. Okay. So Jody, to answer question. your question, yeah. Okay, I've got a lot of questions here. Awesome, okay. awesome. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, if you so just to reiterate, if you wanted to merge into main, you will have to be checked out into main and then do get merged to to the other, whatever you're merging into main? Yep. Okay. So you have to be in main and you say, get merge whatever branch you wanna pull into main. Okay. Does GitHub actually have a solution to an actual conflict case? If, if two people do accidentally work on the same code? Absolutely, it tells you of... to sit down and go through each conflict line by line. If there's any TA on the line that would like to put in a little bit of a light about merge conflicts, feel free. But yes, it is, they ask you, the human, to sit down and go through 
each conflict line by line and figure out which one to accept or which one to disregard or how to merge it. Merge conflicts can take some time. I just went through some today. It's pretty great. I had a question about merge conflicts too, Kyle. What's up? Um, so is it looked down upon, like if your code gets rejected over someone else's? Like, would you want to fight for your code or like, you know, because I'm guessing that both parties are spending hours trying to like make their code correct and they're both submitting at the same time. So it's like, if you're working on a big project and the project is going to be, you know. Um, yeah, so do, in the end, if someone tries to reject somebody else's code, this is the gray area, this is the human element of coding, that the other person is gonna be pretty upset because they spent all that time on there. So to resolve merge conflicts, not just programmically, but also socially, you need to make sure that you are always in communication with your team members. Most teams, as long as you've been on that team or that project for a while, you know your project and you know the areas of your project, which file everyone's gonna be working in. If you know someone's gonna be working at least close to your pro or close to your file or even close to your code base, you need to be in communication with them saying, I need this, and they're gonna say, I need this. And essentially that's that communication aspect. Merge conflicts are more about miscommunication than coding issues. You need to make sure that you are talking with your team and telling them where you're going to be so you guys don't collide. And almost think about it like, you're almost driving with a blindfold on and you're hoping that they are in a different part of the parking lot that you are. Otherwise, you're going to have a collision. So it's all about talking about where you're at. So in the end about the rejection, if someone rejects your code over theirs, either kick that person out or find another job because that is a toxic work environment. I would not stand for that whatsoever. Okay. <laughs> to be absolutely brief. <laughs> Kyle, to follow up on Jaron's example, um, if you were to merge a branch into the main, does what happens to that branch? Is that still there or does that get removed or deleted automatically? It still does. That's a very good question. It still does persist. The branch is there, but its purpose has been met. Do not recycle your branches. I promise you, the computer doesn't care. Don't recycle your branches. You usually just want to delete them. So you have more, once your branch is merged in, you have the right to delete that branch. Don't ever delete main. Don't ever delete your other important branches, but those little, we call them feature branches, the ones that you just spawn off and do something, bring back in, feel free to delete those. But to answer your question, they do persist until they are deleted. And so you'll see sometimes in people's GitHubs, like a thousand branches, because someone just hasn't gone through and deleted the old ones. I, I'm speaking literally from, from experience. So you'll see a lot of branches out there. But yeah, you'll want to delete them and clean them up afterwards. But fantastic question there. Does that make sense, Phil? Thanks yeah, absolutely. Right? Thank you. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I love all these questions. Git is so much fun. It really is like, it's a, it's a mind bender for a second because you really do got to put it into that like mentality of, okay, it looks like a, it's a tree structure kind of thing. Like this is how it works. These are the flows. But once you do get into it, especially after the tonight's studio kind of does start to be like, okay, I can see the possible use for this tool kind of thing. In the beginning, I absolutely despised it. But now I'm like, all right, this thing, I kind of love it. So, and also it has cute little characters too for its logos. Like, can't hate it. Just can't. Look at that thing. I don't even know what that is. Like a mouse slash a, like an octopus or something. I don't know. Anywho, any last, oh, let me get the uh, questions up here. But I think we're good. All right. There's other questions. We got a few other things we got to get through. So I got to keep on going here. If we have any time at the end, we can go through this a little bit more. But all right, everyone. Now the most important question of the day. The Constitution of Florida guarantees the right to freedom from cages and tethers to which pregnant animal? For one million fake dollars. Crocodiles. Yeah, I was gonna say gator. Manatees. Unicorns. This goes back to 1838 and was renewed Eggs. by the Florida Constitution Horses? Constitution in 2021. Or 20, yeah, 2002, excuse me. Yes, pigs is correct. Pigs. All right, in Georgia, it is illegal to dye 
Oh, excuse me. Tie, not die. My gosh. It is legal to tie which animal around a telephone pole? Giraffe. Of course. Dog. I feel like you're looking Snake. these up right Same now. Same one you could tie <laughs> around it. Bear. It of is a giraffe. Yes, it is a giraffe. All right. Why it would anybody that do that? Like, what? what? No, I was just thinking, like, what? I do that all the time with my giraffe. All the time. Like, I, I see why Georgia. Why did. would that even need to be a lot? Like, come uh, on. The, the, their vertebrae are too hey, big. Yeah. Their necks aren't that. Aren't the next? Their necks wouldn't be flexible enough to tie it around a telephone pole. Uh, Jody, well, just know, Google weirdlaws.com. There are billions. Oh, it's of great. I, <laughs> well, what do you think going on today? Oh, yeah, it's awesome. In Boise, I, in Boise, Idaho, it is illegal to fish off of a giraffe's back. That was not one in here, but it is also a fun fact. Hey, Kyle. All right. In, what's up, Eric? I'm sorry. I, I have one more, all right? In Norway, okay, it's illegal up? to get a bear drunk on the third story of a building. I mean, that's somebody dangerous. did that. That's the Prince that of Norway For real. got a bear oh drunk in a building and they made it against the law. Then he did it on that's the third amazing. story of a building on his birthday two years later, and they had to make that specifically a law. Can't oh my gosh. That's wow. so beautiful. Yeah, how's it not covered by the how's it not covered by the in a building one? He's royalty, oh so he was able to just cool. argue. Yeah, true. Yeah. Rich people have way too much time on their hands. Too many giraffes, apparently. All right, in Fountain in South Carolina, which animal must be wearing pants at all times? Humans. No buts. Yeah, Ooh, I guess that is one. But, you know, it's South Carolina. There's n it's not humans. It's only horses. Horses need to have pants to get in McDonald's, but not humans. Yes, horses. Why? I don't know. I didn't want to really what? research into this one, but that is. Maybe because of the droppings. <laughs> Yeah, it's Maybe. really going crap on like a floor. I'm I'm yeah. picturing like cute little horse jeans or something. That's I guess exactly that what more they like look a, like. It needs, it, needs a, it needs a single <laughs> pair of pants with all four legs, and it goes like so, it like goes like up around the rim of their torso. <laughs> oh my god! If you Google uh, horse pants, it's just insane. That's awesome. <laughs> all right, all right, we gotta keep going. We gotta keep going. We're running out of time here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Uh, all right. Let's keep going here. Let's start making things look a little bit more fabulous. That's what I promised in the beginning. That's what we're going to do. Everyone remember, bringing it back in here, bringing it back in, our sites are written using what structured language? That language being HTML, hypertext markup language. This thing is great for building a house. Awesome for building that basic architecture, that basic structure. But if a house was just built and turned away, is that a good site to see? No, not at all. I mean, it's like a house looks nice, but it's truly the decorations that make it look a little bit more spicy. So our sites don't usually look that pretty. I mean, like, honestly, look at it. Like, look at this thing. Like, I, I mean, I made this in a few minutes, but like still, like, I, there's just a giant like tiger butt there, a lion picture, they're gigantic. Like, it's not a pretty site to see here. Henceforth, we need to put a little bit of style into these sites. The way we do that is using a thing called CSS, which this one is called Cascading Style Sheets. This helps us give those sites some style. Remember, HTML is just there for the structure, just for something for the sites to actually compile to make something visible on the screen. But it is with CSS that we can actually use to make things look like it says up there, easy on the eyes. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to actually create a style sheet. So we're gonna go back over to Visual Studio Code just for a moment here. And inside of here, it is very, very specific what we're about to do. I'm gonna create a new file here. Right click, new file. And I'm gonna call this something very specific because it's very important that we do so. It's called styles.css. You will typically see styles.css in most websites. This is, contains our styles. .css is the extension we use for those cascading style sheet files. HTML is, of course, for the HTML files. CSS is for the CSS files, right? Get everything organized with those exact extensions. And you also see that it will do this little hashtag thing here too for CSS. So cool, we have a space to write our CSS, but do we know any CSS yet? At least I don't. So let's go ahead and learn some and see what we can do here. So we're going to bring in that file. Like we said, we called it styles.css. Now, 
in an HTML file, we have a lot of things that we could style. The first thing, so we have sections of our website. As we can see here, we have our, like, we literally have things called sections. We have our headers. We have our H1. We have text. We have a lot of different things that we can truly put some style to. The first things that we're going to look at is we're going to look at trying to put some style into this paragraph here using this tag. Take a very close look. It is the P tag. So let's go ahead and see how we can actually do that using CSS. I want to add style specifically to every P tag in my website. To do that, CSS needs to know, OK, what tag did you want to add styling to again? I say the P tag. So I just place P. If you want to do just a div, you put div here. If you want to do it just for footer, you put footer here. P just is, again, that tag or element name, specifically the element name. This is how we start telling CSS, this is what I want to style. I want to style the P tags. And CSS is like, great, you want to style the P tags. That's amazing. But what in the heck do you want to do? It's like, okay, touche. Let me actually tell you what I want to do. In this case, I want to give it some background color. I want to give my paragraphs background color and color of red. Like, okay, cool. And I was like, okay, I also want my text color, which by the way is just used by these color, to be white. And CSS is like, great, that sounds awesome. So let's go ahead and see it in action. So we go over to styles at CSS. And again, we start with the tag or element name. So we start with P and open and close curly brackets. We say background color. Oop, excuse me. In this case, I said red and I said color of white. Just like that. All right. Now, this is very, very important. We just wrote this out. This is cool. It's not too much code. I get that. But watch these next few steps for all of this to work properly. Our CSS is now written. If we go over to, excuse me, to our code, to our index.html, we see our paragraph is right here. It's all about the lion. We have a couple other ones, but let's focus on the lion. Our background color of our paragraph should be red. We come over here and we refresh. Give it a second because I got all those pictures. We come down to the paragraph. It is not red. It is not red. It's because a CSS file and an HTML file are two different people, two different entities. And right now, they're not talking to each other. Our index.html has no idea about the styles that we want it to have. We haven't told it about the styles. So how could it know? There's no magic behind there to tell about our styles. So we need to include that inside of our HTML code. We need to tell our HTML, hey, look for these styles and do these cool things. So let's go ahead and do that. To, talk, or to tell our HTML about our CSS, we use a very special tag in the head, in the head. Again, we use this in the head. It's our second head tag that we're really going to learn about. And here we use link. Then we say rel say style sheet, say type. This is very specific. Feel free to copy and paste this later. You don't have to really remember all these attributes. But then we're going to say text slash CSS. And then we come over to href. This is the important one. This is where our file is actually located, or the name of our file. Our file is called styles.css. And then we do oh, a slash. Bigger? I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you make that bigger? It's really hard to read. Yes, let me go ahead and see if I can do that real quick. No, I can do that. Oh. Um, I didn't have it down there. Dang it, dang it, dang it. Okay, yeah, let me go get the preferences real quick. Command plus. Command plus, thank you, thank you. Where's plus again? There you go. Shouldn't have the pluses in the keyboard. Perfect. Does that help a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I need to keep that open just a bit. There we go. Okay, so we say link rel style sheet type text slash CSS and then styles at CSS. Let's go ahead and save this. Come back over to here and refresh. And now take a look at it. It is now red with white text. If we come down here, all of our paragraphs, all the p tags are now with that red uh, with that red background with white text. 
Awesome, awesome. All right, going back over to the code here. So, some of you might be asking, okay, if I change this P1 then to the H1, what would happen? Come back over here, we refresh once again. We now see that our H1 is red. It's all about the tag you place there that will start those styles. Awesome. So that is how we do styles on a tag. Let's explore two more ways of creating styles. The next one is a little bit different. Take a very close look at it. It has something new to it. It has a dot. A dot and then the name of a class. Dot my class. This is a style class. Remember the attribute we learned in the beginning of the lecture. It's called class. It's how we group different, excuse me, different tags together. So we're able to style those groups of tags by using that class attribute. And we define the styles for that class attribute here. So in this case, I want to say maybe color of blue. Okay, color again is text color. So we're going to go over our code and do that real quick. So we say dot or period my dash class. And I say color of blue. Then what I'm going to do, so once I have that written, code of index.html. And I see that right here, this H3, I'm going to call it my dash class. And then how about up here for my H1, say class equals my class. Now remember, multiple tags can have classes. So this is awesome, class, my class, welcome to my zoo, and then lion. Both of these should now be blue. Let's save this, go back over to our HTML. We refresh, and now we see welcome to my zoo, welcome, or sorry, and lion are both in blue, while this is still in red. Awesome. One last thing I want to show everyone. And I'm sorry I'm going a little fast on this one, but CSS is something that we can always take slow. There's always fun in styling. Um, one last one right here, my dash ID. And take a very close look at this one, the style ID, and we denote it by a hashtag. Denote it by a hashtag. And here, say we just want to do background color of green. That's awesome. What we can do, excuse me, there we go. Go over to styles and CSS. Hashtag my dash ID. And close there. So background of oh my gosh, what did I used to say it was I'm gonna say green. I forgot what to put eggs exactly. Okay. So we say my ID green. I save that. I come over to index.html. Take a very close look too, by the way. For my class, I'm not putting the dot up here in the in the attribute for HTML. I am not doing that. It will know, that's just for CSS. CSS knows with that dot, then it's a class and it treats it as such when it comes over here. So I wanna make something here green, background green. Someone give me a part of this code that they wanna see the background green. Every letter O. Oh my gosh, Sean. <laughs> Not with this much time remaining. <laughs> How about something else? The bear. H3. The bear. The bear. All right, let's see the bear here. So we want to do an ID. So if someone tell me, what's that attribute we do for this one particularly for my ID? What would we use? Um, my, my ID. ID equals so ID my. equals my dash ID. Yeah, the attribute ID. Very good. That's how we give our tags an ID. Remember, always keep these unique. Always, always, always keep them unique. We come back over here. We refresh. We come down to bear and we see bear now has a background color of green. Look how beautiful our page now looks. Now, one thing we can do here, see how big these images are. A fun thing we can do and why we would want to use that is I'd say IMG. And now I'm going to say max height because I don't want it that big. I want to say a max height of maybe 600 pixels, PX, and a max width of 600 pickle, pix, pickles, 600 pixels. There you go. So many pickles. All right, save that. Come back over here. We refresh and take a look at our pictures now. Oh, so much better. No more tiger butt. Awesome. All because we told our images it has to have a max size. Don't go bigger than this. Now, all of these tags that I'm using, I just know them by heart because I'm a UI designer. So I, I've seen these since I was a wee tot in coding. So does this mean you need to memorize them? Not at all. You will pick up on the common ones here and there 
in your own time. Whenever you want to, feel free to go through the available ones. There are so many for CSS. This is why we didn't go through a lot of them, because if we go over here to our CSS reference, if my computer wants to stop being dramatic, we see that we come here and there are hundreds of possibilities when it comes to styling on our sites. That's how we have the sites that we have today. They look pretty dang good to the eyes. And it's because of all of this fun styling that, that makes it possible. All right, everyone, that is what I have for CSS. The final thing that I have to talk about is that, of course, we need to push our repos and our changes up so you all can see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and say git add period, git commit dash m finished styles right there, and I can say git push. Perfect. All those changes are all for you all to see and take on your own fun adventures with. But other than that, everyone, I have finished this stuff. So awesome job hanging on there. All right, any questions about what we discovered? Very, very liquidly split. I apologize again. I know we're getting close on time, but I wanna go over the big stuff with Git. Mari here for CSS. Anything anybody wants to talk about? I have a question. What's going on? Okay, so um, in our examples, it told us to find a, uh, a CSS property that wasn't already listed, just kind of like know the specs of it. And when I was going through and I was looking at our CSS, I think it was in the W3 or something, um, it, it had like a, a green tag next to all the ones that we're using currently, and it had a, a number, um, I think maybe it was like two point, I don't know, it had a number next to it. So I was wondering if okay. that there's, um, there's like a specific, like to date version of CSS that's more popular for us to use. Uh, uh, so I'm kind of, I'm a little confused about the ask. Are you looking for a property of CSS that you were trying to use or so no. the most up-to-date one is, I believe, so I mean, W3Schools is going to have the most up-to-date here for CSS reference. So I would say go through these and see which ones you're looking for exactly. But I guess what's your specific ask? Like what version of CSS? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's still CSS3. I'll have to look at what exactly the correct version is. Okay. I think we still use CSS3. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, so technically it's 4.15, but most of the properties stay consistent. I mean, th the major ones that you're gonna find in here are gonna stay consistent. It's a small little, I'm not gonna go into it, but it's the smaller things with browsers here and there that are gonna change. But if you follow this reference, you're gonna do completely fine with the stuff that we're gonna be getting into. Okay. Cool. All right, any other questions about CSS? Do we cover Bootstrap? Uh, I don't know if I had Bootstrap in there. I don't see it in my list of stuff to do. Is Bootstrap in there? I don't think we did. If anybody wants to go into Bootstrap, Bootstrap is a way of styling stuff with heavy styling, uh, basically right out of the box. Go to Bootstrap 4 or Google Bootstrap 4 if you guys want to go into that. That's bringing in basically external CSS styles into your stuff. So Bootstrap 4 CSS. Go ahead and show that real quick, just for a moment. There you go, Bootstrap most popular, which is a lie. Sorry, professionalism coming out. All right, Bootstrap here, go ahead and feel free to download it. We'll download the CSS files. You can then import it using that link tag that we talked about. Um, if you have any questions about it specifically, feel free to reach out directly. Um, but this is a way we can, I'm gonna go over in the next lecture just a little bit so we can actually, actually have some good styles there. But Bootstrap is a way we can quickly style stuff on our site instead of making all of our individual styles one by one. All right, everyone. That being said, we are officially done and two minutes over time and I apologize.